Greetings, everyone. Very happy to welcome you for another uh, episode here with American philosopher Adrian Johnson. Welcome, Adrian. How are you today? I'm doing great. And Daniel, thank you so much for inviting me to be on the podcast. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, I mean, I'll do a uh, introduction of you later. And I think folks generally that listen to our program know, know about your work. Um, and one of the things that's really striking, I want to begin with this, Adrian, is you know, most people that know about philosophy, they know about the fact that there's these two camps, the analytics and the continental kind of orientation. You're somebody who has really bridged that in a serious way. Um, so therefore, uh, is that a real difference if for you? And and kind of just speak a little bit about it and, and um, what it means for you. Yes. Well, I should I, I should start with a, a biographical detail that's that's relevant to this. Um, my father was himself trained as an Anglo-American analytic philosopher. He wrote a dissertation on uh, Quine and on Quine's uh, undermining of the strict distinction between the a priori and the, I'm sorry the analytic and the synthetic uh, distinction. Uh, you know, apropos, you know, the status of, of certain judgments um, and used, uh, you know, Quine's work on the analytic synthetic distinction to, uh, you know, raise certain issues about in moral philosophy, uh, the prescriptive descriptive division, the distinction between is and not. Um, and, uh, you know, my father, uh, you know, having this analytic training, although he eventually went into uh, IT and, you know, ha ended up having a career outside of academia, uh, you know, based on, you know, in terms of his work on computer science. Um, I, uh, you know, I was exposed to analytic philosophy first and foremost through him as I was growing up. Um, but uh, I developed, you know, starting in, in high school in part thanks to some books on a shelf that I discovered that were tucked away in the bottom that were the continental materials uh, that, you know, I came across Nietzsche, Heidegger, Derrida, Foucault, and started reading stuff. that. Right. Yes, yes. Which he was like, oh, my gosh, it's just, you know, in, you know, uh, uh, obscurantist, impenetrable <laughs> nonsense. You know, good luck with it. See if you can make heads or tails of it. I tried, whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, and in a way it was as my interests in continental European philosophy were developing, you know, I was still, of course, um, you know, steeped in you know, uh, analytic approaches, you know, thanks to my father and still, you know, having regular conversations with him about what I was working on. And I think that was the beginning of, in a way, you know, training me to be comfortable um, speaking to people on both sides of the continental analytic divide. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, that has ended up continuing in various ways and, of course, deeply informs, uh, you know, the way I approach things. Um, you know, in terms of the more substantial level, apart from this biographical detail, you know, for me, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, and the way that there are various ways one can approach interfacing continental and analytic philosophy. I mean, one of the most obvious is that, well, both orientations in the 20th century do share uh, a common concern with the, the importance of language for philosophy itself, as well as for who and what we are as the sort of, as the sort of creatures that, that we are. Um, and so both traditions have their version of the linguistic turn that you know, colors a lot of what happens in Europe and in the Anglophone world in the 20th century. Um, but there's also, you know, what I focus on more is the issue of, well, how strangely it seems that um, apropos questions about nature, naturalism, the natural sciences, that, you know, this set of topics is also, of course, a big dividing mm. line between the two. Mm. And that, you know, especially if you look at, you know, 20th century continental European philosophy, you know, much of that is colored by a certain kind of 
uh, pronounced, you know, anti-naturalism, you know, wariness, even phobia in relation to the natural sciences, you know, that has its roots in, in things like, you know, late 18th, early 19th century German romanticism, you know, also in certain variants of, you know, Kantian and Fichtean transcendental idealism, etc. And all of that then, you know, sets up a, a kind of dominant anti-naturalist orientation that, you know, there are exceptions to this, but certainly is, you know, much more predominant uh, mm -hmm. and much more the the rule in yeah. uh, on the continental side of things. And it's as though, you know, issues having to do with especially the natural sciences that was left to analytic philosophers to to deal with. Yeah. Um, and you know, of course, I I feel that. Um, you know, the analytic philosophers are right to take seriously just how important issues having to do with nature, naturalism, science, etc., are for who, who and what we are as the kind of beings that we are. But I think that at the same time, the continental tradition has all of these rich resources for developing a much more sophisticated kind of naturalism than the types often on offer mm. in analytic venues. Yeah. Um, because analytic philosophers, in terms of their history of philosophy training, for them, often it's just they go up through Kant, then they look at the rest of what happens starting in the German speaking world after Kant as a descent into speculative madness, mm -hmm. you know, to be avoided. And then they, you know, they skip over pretty much everything after Kant until early in the 20th century, Frege, Russell, Wittgenstein and company. And, right. you know, in my view, you know, post-Kantian German idealism, Marxist historical and dialectical materialisms, et cetera, all of these post-Kantian 19th century developments um, provide us with, uh, you know, an adequate set of conceptual resources for developing, I think, a much more sophisticated naturalism. But this, for me to pull this off, requires, of course, borrowing from both analytic and continental camps and, you know, mm -hmm. taking certain things from, from, you know, German idealism, Marxism, psychoanalysis on the continental side, interfacing that with the natural sciences, um, you know, and, and with some of the same material that a lot of analytic uh, philosophers of mind, philosophers of science, et cetera, are grappling with, and to, you know, bring these together. And um, yeah, that is definitely one of the red threads of my research program. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's amazing. So you started off, and correct me, um, for just, just based on your pub published books, really looking at the nexus of Lacanian psychoanalysis and questions within Marxism more broadly, and specifically looking at the meta psychology of Lacan, and mm -hmm. and then you know you moved on to to um, uh, you know work on Zizek's ontology and Zizek's thought, which we'll talk about. But what drew you to Lacan? Uh, was it was it having to do with your philosophical commitments and this kind of notion that the Slovene school put down? I guess back in the eighties, nineties now. Um, uh, of of the only way to kind of reconcile a, re a revamped German idealism is through Lacan's insights. Um, yeah. I don't know if we can credit them with kind of um, initiating that that project, but you're definitely in that field. How did you come to that field? There were there were several avenues. Um, now academically. Um, I can say that, well, during my undergraduate studies, um, when I was a philosophy major at the University of Texas at Austin, um, you know, I, I, I was, you know, at that point, you know, very invested in, you know, certain core continental figures. You know, I mentioned, you know, uh, Heidegger, Foucault, Derrida a while ago. Um, you know, I was interested in them. I was beginning to read things like Deleuze and Guattari, et cetera. Um, and I noticed, especially with some of my interests in post-war French thought, that, you know, it was very clear to me just how important psychoanalysis, both Freudian and Lincolnian, was to a lot of the thinkers who I was reading. Um, and it, I don't recall if it was my sophomore or junior year, but you know, in, in the middle of my time at UT, um, I noticed that there was a course that was uh, being offered this one semester on, it was entitled uh, Freud and Lacan with Kristeva. And it was taught by a faculty member, Katie Arends, uh, who's in the Department of Germanic Studies there. And given the other things that I was reading, I thought, oh, this is great. This is a perfect opportunity for me to, you know, get some of that background in psychoanalysis so as to better appreciate, 
you know, these other authors who I'm interested in and who are obviously indebted to and drawing from um, the analytic tradition. Um, so I took that course and it's funny, I was immediately seduced by Freud. Um, you know, that, that the, the clarity, the rigor, the explanatory power, um, you know, the fact that I was suddenly seeing just, you know, you know, various and sundry, you know, daily interactions with other people, just in my personal life, et cetera, uh, suddenly in a new light, um, you know, with what felt like a dramatically enhanced understanding. Um, and so it was really kind of a, you know, a sort of a road to Damascus revelation sort of experience. Mm. And I was just bowled mm. over by by the power mm. of of you know, Freud's perspective uh, yeah. for, you know, making sense of ourselves um, right down to, you know, the intimate details of my daily life. Um, yeah. And so that was kind of a conversion experience. But what's funny is, is that in that seminar that I was taking that semester with Renz, um, initially I found Lacan off-putting. Um, I, I worked through, you know, the material for the course, and I worked quite hard on it. Um, but um, my initial reaction to Lacan was that it, the same as that of so many other people, that, you know, a lot of this seems to be deliberate obscurantism, smoke and mirrors, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, after that, uh, you know, I, it took a few years for me to really get drawn back into Lacan. But what was happening was I was working still a lot on Freud, um, you know, and I ended up writing my senior honors thesis at UT on Foucault's critique of psychoanalysis, um, mm. defending Freud against a lot of that. Mm. Um, and then I did use some Lacan and some other, and, you know, Kristeva and some other French psychoanalytic resources for that. But it was... Um, you know, it was more a, a defense of Freud contra Foucault. Right. Um, but as I was continuing to read, especially a lot of post-war French stuff, I realized, well, I have to spend even more time on Lacan, despite my, my initial distaste for it. Um, and uh, I forced myself to go back and, and read more Lacan, you know, and gradually I was drawn in. And, yeah. you know, it, learning Lacan is, I mean, apart from the issue of English versus French, I mean, just... Mm. Getting comfortable with Lacan, as with certain other figures, it's a matter of, in part, really learning their language, learning, you know, to, to you know, follow a very specific, uh, you know, vocabulary with a particular style of expression, etc. But it was an acquired taste. But once I acquired it, um, you know, it became as, uh, you know, as important to me as, as Freudian psychoanalysis as well. And that, you know, and... You know, in graduate school, it's in the early years of my doctoral studies that I realized, no, I really do want to, you know, focus on Lacan. But yeah. then there's there's personally a, a, a factor here, too. Um, and it's one that didn't become clear to me until I was a postdoc. And uh, one of the postdocs that I was on was an extended one at Emory University where I was doing my clinical psychoanalytic training as part of it. Um, and without going into details, without being, you know, exhibitionistic about my private life, I can say that, you know, my family history, uh, you know, and, and various, you know, various aspects of my own, you know, idiosyncra idiosyncratic psyche and libidinal economy were such that, you know, my investment in psychoanalysis was more than, of course, just purely intellectual, that there were, you know, there were, even if in sublimated disguise forms, things that I was working through apropos, mm -hmm. you know, my own life, my own past, my childhood, my family, etc. cetera, um, that, you know, I was finding a way, however unconsciously, to work through thanks to psychoanalysis. Um, yeah. And so the training really kind of had me looking at my investment in it from, you know, this private personal side, um, as much as in terms of understanding why intellectually I was attracted to it in mm -hmm. the course of my education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, at what point did you encounter Zizek's work? Because you are uh, known, I, and rightly so, as one of, and I think Slavoj would even uh, confirm this, as one of the, the clearest um, expositors and articulators of exactly what Zizek's project is about. And, and you have, in, in many ways, sought to further it, to uh, extend it in your book on um, um, transcendental materialism on Zizek's ontology, which is an incredible work, uh, which has almost given birth to a bunch of other projects uh, that you've written about. 
um, you make an, an, a wonderful kind of clarification, which is we can't understand Slavoj Žižek's thought as a kind of cultural critique alone, but rather yeah. there's a deep undergirding philosophical effort there. And, you know, one at one point Žižek mentioned to me in an interesting way that less than nothing, his huge book on Hegel actually sells the most compared to his cultural study book. So there's a kind of interesting dynamic in which Hegel is in right now. There's, I would call a Hegel renaissance going on in our culture, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And Zizek, yep. obviously Zizek is a part of that. You're a part of that. Many people are part of that. Um, and I want to talk about that, but let's talk about your first touch with Zizek himself. How did you encounter his thought? I, uh, you know, I came across it early in, in my graduate studies. Um, so it was really during my first year in the doctoral program at SUNY Stony Brook, where I, where I got my PhD. Um, and, you know, at the time I was, you know, beginning to get much more serious about working on Lacan, you know, and I was, I was realizing that chances are um, for the dissertation I eventually want to do, um, you know, Lacanian psychoanalysis will be, you know, really in a way the kind of central organizing theoretical orientation, you know, despite, you know, me thinking of my Lacanianism as, you know, not distinct from also a deep investment in Freud himself. But um, it, during my first year of graduate school, I was spending a lot of time on my own on psychoanalysis, continuing work I had already, you know, gotten engaged with as an undergraduate. And during the year off, I took between undergraduate and graduate school. And um, I was also, uh, you know, for instance, one of the seminars I took my first semester at Stony Brook was on Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. And I was beginning to realize just how much German idealism had to offer me, uh, you know, in terms of some of what I was also doing, you know, apropos psychoanalytic metapsychology. Um, and, you know, it, with that realization, um, it I then alighted upon some of Zizek's books. And this was in the 90s when he was doing that work in that period um, that really was, uh, you know, laying the foundations of, you know, his core project of, you know, synthesizing German idealism and Lacanianism. Um, you know, books like Tearing with the Negative, Indivisible Remainder, etc. Um, and, you know, in fact, I, if I recall correctly, um, in that first year of graduate school, I, the, the initial thing that uh, I picked up and read and that drew me in immediately was Tearing with the Negative, which, you know, Slavoj will even sometimes say is still to this day his favorite, his single favorite book that he's done. Um, and, you know, that, that book just it's like it grabbed me by, you know, uh, you know, by the shirt and shook me and, you know, made me realize, all right, this is, you know, uh, uh, very much in the vein of, you know, what, uh, you know, I, I, I think, you know, is, you know, a very fruitful, very rich, you know, a kind of orientation or research program in terms of this bringing together of German idealism and psychoanalysis yeah. that I want to, you know, I want to explore further. I want to make contributions mm -hmm. to, et cetera. Um, and so I then just set about devouring every Zizek book I could get my hands on. And at the same time, um, like a year or so later, um, and particularly once I had begun my dissertation, which became my first book, Time Driven, that was eventually published in 2005, um, I met Slavoj at uh, a conference. It was a SPET gathering in, at the University of Oregon. Um, he, he gave a keynote, and I asked him a question, and then I came up to him afterward and talked, and he said, well, you know, I'm going to be in New York next week. Email me in the meantime, and you know we'll we'll we'll, con we'll confer further. Um, and you know, I sent him portions of my dissertation. We met up uh, in Manhattan when he was giving the talk at a Lacanian Inc. event, and we agreed that he would you know serve on my dissertation committee. Um, and uh, you know, and then I would meet with him whenever he would come into the city, since I was just outside you know in Long <laughs> Island. I'd come in, we'd meet, we'd you know, talk over what I was doing. And then, you know, the rest of the dissertation supervision we'd handle by email. Um, and so, you know, he had a very direct role then in, in sort of shaping some of what I was thinking and doing, mm -hmm. you know, even at the dissertation stage. Um, but it was, you know, it was really coming to Stony Brook with my psychoanalytic interests, 
and then really developing um, this this uh, you know investment in German idealism, you know, thanks to some of what I was doing in my coursework at Stony Brook, that then prompted me to turn to Zizek, and then eventually right. you know working with him. Um, yeah, and that's how that's how that all began. That's, and, that's great. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of people don't realize. I think Adrian that Zizek is a product or the outcome of a school of research a collective or effort um uh, which you know Alenka Zupanchik and Malad and Dolar are two other names but there's a bunch of other people too in Slovenia that have actually sought that have been at the ground floor of a philosophical overturning of Lacan for our time and you are a kind of surrogate uh member of the Slovene school I think it's fair to say uh, <laughs> Could you could you envision something like that happening in America? Something like a kind of a kind of you know because part of the the success of Zizek's project is obviously owed to his own um, very interesting style and his very unique uh, method. Of course, I won't take that yeah. away from him, but I, I I do think that folks need to read him in that context of a of a kind of of a collective effort. Um, and Dolar is actually the senior figure amongst the the, the troika up there. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, and also maybe the prospects of what it means to actually do theoretical work as a part of a collective? And you know, I and I we we lack that a lot in America. Um, we're very kind of atomized. Um, what do what do you what do you make of that? Yeah, I, and I think some of this, um, you know, one thing that occurs to me, and it's funny, when I teach, you know, anything in French philosophy, especially, you know, if it's a seminar that involves multiple figures from, you know, a certain, you know, period or orientation with, you know, 20th century French philosophy, um, one thing that I remind the students of, usually several times over the course of the semester, is that we have to realize that, you know, France is incredibly you know, by comparison with, you know, an American perspective is incredibly centralized, right? I mean, Paris is it, you know, and if you are going to be seriously, deeply engaged, you know, in certain discussions and debates are going to have like a, a certain, you know, over a certain threshold of influence, you know, et cetera, you really need to to be there and to be part of that institutional and intellectual scene. Um, and that, you know, all of these figures, you know, were, you know, intermingling, knew each other, et cetera. And you have all of this, you know, richness and complexity in part because of, you know, everything being concentrated in this one place, right, in Paris. And, you know, likewise, I mean, of course, in a place like, you know, I mean, you know significantly smaller country, Slovenia, I mean, you know, with Ljubljana as well, and, you know, with, with these countries where the entire culture really is, in a, in a way, centered on a unique place. Um, I think that makes the likelihood of some of these collaborative developments being able to happen greater, or at least, you know, it might change. I mean, here we are, of course, you and I are, are, are having this, this, you know, virtual face-to-face -face conversation. I do think that, you know, Zoom and other technologies are going to, I think, one of the lasting legacies of the pandemic for us is that it's going to make collaborative work like this much more, yeah, much more the norm, um, mm -hmm. which I'm glad about. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, in the United States, it's harder for it to happen here in part because you know those of us with shared interests tend to be scattered all over the place, right? I mean, here I am out in Albuquerque, which sometimes feels like you know, yeah, you know, my my protracted solitude in the desert, you know, where I feel you know very much on my own out here, and that you know the people who are intellectually closest to me are all far away. I mean, whether right. in other parts of the U.S. or over in Europe or what have you, um, and um, it does make it a bit harder, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and we're trying things like, you know, right now I'm still in the midst of negotiating with my university administration about a, setting up a dedicated exchange program between my department and the Institute for Philosophy in Ljubljana, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, Alenka, among others, is housed. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're trying to work out the details of that so that we can have this dedicated exchange program to allow for, you know, our doctoral students to go spend time over in Ljubljana and then 
doctoral and postdoctoral researchers from Ljubljana coming to spend time, you know, in my department here at UNM. Um, and we've done, uh, you know, we've done a couple of, of visits uh, by different people. And yeah. I'm scheduled to go to Ljubljana soon as part of this. Um, and so we're trying to set up something like that. Um, I'm trying to be more involved with, um, you know, with Zoom events, with, um, you know, the online opportunities I mentioned a moment ago that are, I think, thanks to the pandemic, you know, becoming much more uh, uh, common. And I think, again, that's for the best for us. But, yeah, I mean, I, I do, you know, I think that... Um, there is, though, uh, you know, this. There has managed to be this cohesion of not only you know the Slovenes themselves in terms of the Ljubljana school, you know, with Dolar, Zizek, and Zupancic as kind of the 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 you know the tripartite core. Um, that you know that that has become you know what they've developed and that they should be credited with having developed in terms of especially this this core project of synthesizing German idealism and psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, has broadened out and involves other people such as myself, but uh, many others too. Yeah. And I do think it has become an orientation uh, that, uh, you know, is, is highly distributed across multiple persons right. working on different aspects. Right. And I think following Marx, I mean, you know, look, it's <laughs> Hegel was the last philosopher to really, in, with even some degree of credibility, be able to present this encyclopedic system that, you know, proposed to address everything under the sun. I mean, the sheer production of human knowledge, uh, you know, has pushed us to a point, you know, at which the only way to make headway on any of the things we're interested in is collectively, you know, no one of us in isolation is going to be able to figure all of this yeah. out, you know, from, you know, yeah. sitting in, you know, in our armchairs in the study. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, for me, I mean, philosophy needs to be interdisciplinary. It needs to be collective. It needs to, um, you know, involve many people working on different aspects, uh, you know, but then at the same time, looking at how they might, you know, bring together some of the results of their separate, you know, projects, et cetera. Um, you know, much more in a, I mean, not, it's not that we operate like natural scientists, but, you know, there is, you know, in the sciences, that sense of, you know, we all need to work on, you know, various pieces of this much bigger puzzle and that it really has to be a highly distributed collective social effort, you mm -hmm. know, for us to make any headway. And I think, you know, that holds too. And even in the humanities at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, great. So I want to roll up the sleeves a little bit. I think actually your sleeves are already rolled up, so you're prepared. Uh, we want to jump into some clarification on your concepts, your ideas, your philosophy, okay? And frankly, the nice thing about Adrian's philosophy is that you are working on a trilogy, a prolegomena to any future materialism, which is itself, as I've already mentioned, working comfortably across the continental analytic divide, but which is also uh, deeply committed to a kind of reinterrogation of the Marxist historical materialist orientation, a reinterrogation of Frederick Engels's dialectics of nature, a reinterrogation of how to deal with the problem of the Hegelian legacy. And you're, you're, you're in dialogue with a number of really, really important interlocutors. Let us begin with a, a grounding here in what a transcendental materialist orientation actually is. How would you, how would you give this uh, uh, definition uh, on an elevator uh, where you know you have like a minute to go down, and um, the person in the elevator with you is like uh, doesn't really understand much about philosophy, maybe, or somebody on a YouTube watching a video and they maybe don't really know about. So, so what would you say? Well, the elevator pitch version of my position would run something like this. What I am interested in doing is coming up with an account of who and what we human beings are, both as you know, individuals and as collectives, both as subjects and societies, how it is that we, with all of our idiosyncrasies and peculiarities as members of the species Homo sapiens, that makes us just dramatically different from 
you know, the rest of the animal world as, you know, well, as well as seemingly very unusual or exceptional in relation to the, you know, the material world, the physical universe as a whole, what sort of nature, what sort of physical universe or material reality do we have to presuppose in order to explain how it is that that nature has given rise to the weird denaturalized beings that we are, right? So a natural account of the genesis of denaturalized or, you know, more than natural, irreducible to nature humans, both singularly and in aggregate, both as subjects and societies, individuals and collectives, um, how it is that this dis distinct domain of human reality in all of its strangeness and, and distinctness vis-a-vis -vis the rest of nature, how nonetheless it arose from that same nature. Um, and, you know, it's in a way, you might say, an attempt to offer a non-dualistic account you know, where we just start with one and only one dimension of being, namely, you know, physical reality or nature, starting from that kind of monism of there's just nature, how do we get everything that leads us to find dualism appealing in terms of distinctions like mind versus body, you know, subject versus object, etc.? How do those distinctions arise out of, you know, how do you basically, you might call it, you know, how do you get the emergence of dualism out of monism? Hmm. Um, you know, that, that it's at risk being overly simplistic, but at the same time, I think is the, you know, five minute elevator pitch, yeah. you know, that so that's really you, the, the, the essence of it. How do you, how do you link back transcendental and then how do you link back um, materialist to that wonder, that was a very good, you know, summation, but can you kind of go back and say, okay, yeah. well, this is what I mean by the, and this is what I mean by a materialist. Yeah. Well, to cut a long story short, I, and this requires me making arguments in some of my work, um, for some philosophers, um, there is a distinction between materialism and naturalism. And that, you know, for instance, you could be some sort of materialist without being a naturalist. You know, one example would be, you know, on the Western Marxist reading, starting with the young Lukács, Marx is a historical materialist. So he's a materialist about human beings and their social history, but he is not a naturalist, you know, in the way that someone like Engels with his broadened out dialectical materialism wants to be. Um, you know, so there's that idea of, okay, you can be a materialist, but a materialist about human societies as ultimately influenced by the economy more than anything else on balance, etc. And that can be called materialism, but that doesn't involve any claims about you know, whether being in its most, you know, primitive or original form is, is the same as what we call nature, you mm. know, et cetera. Those issues just, you can sidestep. Um, and, you know, for instance, you have some more recently, a French philosopher like Alain Badiou, you know, claimed to be a materialist, but a strange sort of platonic materialist who's also an anti-naturalist, et cetera. Mm. Um, um, and so for some philosophers, materialism and naturalism are actually to be carefully held apart, to be distinguished. For me, I am very much opposed to that. And I think, you know, you make a mockery of the very notion of materialism if you refuse to have any truck with nature, the natural sciences, et cetera, that any really materialist materialism, any, any mm. position that, you know, warrants being identified as properly materialist needs to have at least some qualified sort of naturalism mm -hmm. as part of its ontology. So for me, when I say materialism in the phrase transcendental materialism, you know, I mean a form of materialism where the idea is, is that at, at its most foundational levels, this is also a commitment to some form of naturalism. And mm -hmm. to say nature is the, the zero level starting point, um, we arise from it, um, not from elsewhere, whatever that elsewhere is specified to be. You know, and, and so that equivalence between naturalism and materialism, although they're, I'm skipping over some you know, thorny yeah. problems for now, but that's part of it. And then the transcendental part, well, this, you know, because I first coined the phrase transcendental materialism to capture Zizek's position as per that, that 
now it's been quite a while, that book from a while ago, the Zizek's ontology book, um, because what I saw Zizek is struggling to do through his shotgun marriage of German idealism and psychoanalysis was to say, okay, you know, how do we, you know, get the sort of subjectivity that is of central concern to German idealism, a form of subjectivity that of course, initially we associate with what Kant calls, you know, transcendental subjectivity, um, and then, you know, gets taken up and, 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 you know, reworked in various ways by Kant's successors, primarily Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel. Um, but, uh, you know, that, there's an aspect to German idealist subjectivity, regardless of which of the big four you're talking about, where you are, what, what they are, looking to get to grips with is something which does trace back to the dawn of philosophical modernity with Descartes. It's, it's a subject that is in certain ways still akin to the Cartesian cogito, you know, and this idea of this, you know, this self-relating subject um, that enjoys a certain, you know, independence or autonomy vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, everything else, including its own body, the larger physical reality that body is a part of, etc. Um, and so, you know, it's really an issue of how do you get the cogito-like transcendental subject of German idealism out of, you know, how do you basically have a materialist ontology that allows for the genesis of cogito-like subjectivity? Because it would seem as if you're a materialist, then you're going to just, you know, reduce mind to body, um, you know, mm. subject to brain, et cetera. And mm. that's that. But, you know, if you have a more sophisticated non-reductive naturalism, and here's where I think for myself and Zizek, there's also not just political, but philosophical slash metaphysical importance to Marxism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, you see how, you know, this, this issue begins to get taken up in certain ways by Marxists, starting, I think, really with the angles of the dialectics of nature and, and related works. Um, and, you know, integrating that with the German idealism and psychoanalysis, you know, allows one then to come up with a position where you can say, all right, overall, the ontology is materialist, mm -hmm. but that doesn't preclude this. And in fact, what's important is having this ontology such that it can contain within itself mm -hmm. a theory of more than material, like irreducibly mm -hmm. non-natural, cogito-like, transcendental subjectivity. Yeah. And that apparent paradox is uh, that I don't think actually is a paradox is, you know, where where I think Zizek and I share a very common, you know, you know, metaphysical preoccupation that I initially brought out in that book on his ontology from back in 2008. Yeah. What is, where is Lacan here? Because Lacan says the unconscious is not uh, to be theorized as an ontology. And I want to I want to invite you to uh, talk about why Lacan for you and why Lacan and Lacan called himself an anti-philosopher. Yeah. Alain Badiou says, to paraphrase, any philosopher today is really not worth anything until they have passaged, until they had the courage to work through Lacan all the way. Yeah. Um, and yeah. That, that, that actually, you, you need to read that literally in, in the sense that actually, um, I don't know if it's a monastic call or a kind of plea, which is, I mean, maybe it is in the sense it's like, there's this painstaking work you have to do. And so, okay, it's not self-evident. Why? What, what is the value? And obviously a lot of analytic philosophers, including Robert Pippin, <laughs> uh, will we'll famously say Lacan is above my pay grade. Pippin says that. And of course he's at the University of Chicago, so I don't know how that works. But um, why Lacan <laughs> here? Well, you know, it's fortuitous that you mentioned Badiou in, in you know, posing this question. Um, and I should say, uh, the Badiou who you, you reference, the one who says that, you know, all contemporary philosophers really need as a sort of rite of passage to work through Lacan, uh, you know, in order to be able to make further headway philosophically. Um, I, I feel very sympathetic toward that sentiment. And more importantly, um, this is the same Badiou who also, um, you know, when asked about his own, in particular, his own like intellectual philosophical biography, he routinely will will remind his audiences that when he was, you know, really coming into his own as a young philosopher, mm 
he's, he consistently says, at that time, I had three masters, as he puts it, uh, you know, uh, in 20th century French philosophy. You know, initially he started out when he was very young as a passionate Sartrean. Yep. So there was, you know, there's Sartre. Um, and then, of course, you know, in particular, thanks to studying with him at the Ecole Normale Supérieure, there's Althusser. And then he says, third, there's Lacan. So, you know, Badiou identifies this trio of Sartre, Althusser, and Lacan. And the way that um, he presents Lacan there is that he comes to Lacan having already developed these somewhat conflicting allegiances to Sartre and Althusser, and that it's Lacan who helps him kind of bring together the virtues of Sartrean existentialism with Althusserian Marxism while avoiding some of the problems with those two mm -hmm. uh, orientations. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, I mean, Badiou, in a way, presents it as you know, Lacan being the compatibilist compromise between you know, the Sartre, the early Sartre especially, um, who uh, uh, insists on the you know, absolute primacy of human freedom and of the radically autonomous you know, self-determining subject versus Althusser, especially the classic Althusser of you know, 1965's Reading Capital and Four Marx, you know, who seems much more um, the you know, Marxist version of a sort of structuralist determinist, you know, for whom you know, any subject is merely subjected to this trans-individual matrix of, you know, in, in Althusser's case, social structures that you know, really run the show and pull the strings of us as puppets. Um, and so you have, you know, the, you, know, you have Sartre and freedom, you have Althusserian determinism, and then for Badiou, you have Lacan, who is attempting, and I think Badiou is quite correct about this, um, you have a Lacan who is working with similar tensions in terms of some of his inspirations and sources and attempting to develop a version of psychoanalysis where you know the the cliche of it is that psychoanalysis is a discourse of determinism. Um, that you know when you you look at how it is even represented in popular culture to this day, you know with the cliche "Tell me about your mother," you know the analyst, and then you know what everyone is is expecting is that the analyst is going to deliver this explanation to analyzons of, well. It, because of X, Y, and Z in your past, you know, due to the sort of childhood that you had, the die was already cast, you know, um, and you just have to make your peace with the fact that this is how things have to be, you know, because, you know, as Wordsworth put it, you know, the child is the father of the man. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, Lacan is aware that that doesn't really do justice to Freud or to the Freudian experience. Um, but at the same time, it is true that the psychoanalysis does, of course, involve us facing up to us being much more determined than we might suspect, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to below the, you know, behind the veil of repression, below the threshold of, of restricted conscious awareness, um, you know, that indeed there is much that is at work that we are not in control of, and that is, you know, much more in control of us than, than we are of it. Hmm. But at the same time, you know, psychoanalysis is not a matter of, oh, well, you know, you are a prisoner of your past. You, you know, you you just simply have to resign yourself to, you know, how you know how things were and how things have to be now, thanks to how they were. Right. Um, psychoanalysis yeah. is ultimately a discourse on on subjective freedom and the achievement of. Of, of freedom in a way which is extremely robust and very radical. Anybody that's yeah. in psychoanalysis will know that. Yeah, and I think that, but I think Lacan really has to be credited with helping to, to bring this out to, to a certain extent yeah. in a way that I don't think Freud himself does in part because, you know, Freud was deliberately holding a lot of philosophical figures, questions, problems, discussions at arm's length. Mm. You know, due to the fact that early on in his career, he developed a, a wariness of or even aversion to what he was familiarized with as philosophy, you know, despite the influence of Brentano on him um, early in his education, you know, that for Freud, when he looked at the influence that in particular Schelling and Schelling's Naturphilosophy had on 19th century German biology and medicine, mm. um, you know, he, you know, quickly came to the conclusion that this is um, and this is epistemologically irresponsible. It doesn't have a rigorous, reliable method. Um, and it leads to a lot of, in medicine, and quackery, 
um, and in in supposed science, non scientific flights of imaginative fancy. Right. Um, yeah, but I should also say about Lacan and freedom. I mean, one way I think to put Lacan's position that is that dovetails with I think how Badiou reads him on this is that you know Freud has this wonderful one liner about the superego at one point in his later work, and where he says, apropos the superego. Quote, the normal man is not only far more immoral than he believes, he is also far more moral than he knows, end quote. Um, and, you know, with the superego, especially the unconscious dimensions of what we call conscience, mm. and, you know, that, that very word is problematic once you acknowledge that there are unconscious dimensions to this, you know, self-regulation of a moralistic sort. Um, that for Freud, well, insofar as, you know, much of the superego is unconscious. Well, the unconscious weirdly contains both the, you know, amoral or immoral parasitical incestuous urges of, of the seething cauldron of the id, but it also at the same time contains these constellations of identified with interjected norms, principles, values, etc. that we hold ourselves responsible in relation to even without knowing that we're doing so. Um, and so if the unconscious contains both of those things, it contains both the you know, two extreme ends of our immorality and our morality. And I would say likewise with the freedom determinism issue, you could say paraphrasing this very Freud that I quoted a moment ago, you know, the normal person is not only, you know, far more determined than he or she believes, but also far freer than he or she knows. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's not either or, it's both at the same time. And I think, you know, experiencing those two extremes as simultaneously operative is yeah. part of the analytic experience as well. Yeah. So let's, 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 you, you invoked Freud's reading of Schelling, which is fascinating. And obviously Schelling is, uh, really an interesting philosopher. I, um, you know, we were just doing a conference on Lukács and Lukács yeah. identifies Schelling as the godfather of, of irrationalism within German idealism. Obviously, you know, you and Zizek have a completely different reading of Schelling and you incorporate Schelling as, as I, as I would summarize it and invite you to, to elaborate to basically, um, compensate for some, limitations within Hegel. Uh, so so there's that, but you also are really looking at the kind of, really the ground the groundwork of of this ontology of error or ontology of the of the whole H O L E uh, yeah. is very Schellingian. Yeah. So what what do you summarize as like, okay, this is how Schelling, this is what he's bringing to the table for us. What what is he bringing to the table that's that's valuable? Yes. Um, now, one uh, and I want to right up front note something that, and this is as much to to remind myself to come back to this as 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 to uh, prompt you to remind me of this if I forget. Um, uh, over the past few years, I mean, one of the big disagreements between myself and Zizek that you know has become clear to the two of us is that in in certain ways, he is much more Schellingian than I am, that Schelling is uh, a, a, a greater significance and centrality to Zizek's version of the German idealism he wishes to couple with psychoanalysis than for me. And in fact, here, you know, even though, of course, you mentioned a while ago, Zizek's 20, uh, 2012 book, Less Than Nothing, Hegel in the Shadow of Dialectical Materialism, his quote unquote big Hegel book, um, you know, that of course, you know, Zizek is, is one of the things he's very well known for is being this, um, you know, contemporary defender of Hegel who, you know, has played no small part in what you rightly characterize as today's Hegel Renaissance. Um, but, you know, by his own admission for Zizek, there are certain places where he definitely prefers Schelling over Hegel. Um, and um the the way that the, so there's this um volume on i don't know if the title is going to be zizek and his critics but it's a volume of that sort where there are a number of contributors who you know lay out you know positions in response to zizek's work and then he gets to respond to each of of the contributors um and we both have you know our pieces done for this volume and the in this forthcoming exchange the issue plays out as you know, in terms of talking about a philosophy of nature, and of course, both Schelling and Hegel 
one of the things that they have in common that distinguishes them from Kant and Fichte as the two other members of the big four of German idealism is that they aren't strict anti-naturalists in the way that Kant and Fichte are. Um, uh, that in fact, they seek to have an account of subjectivity that in some way or another relates it to what we call nature. So both of them, both Schelling and Hegel developed philosophies of nature. And um, Zizek, when it comes to the sorts of issues that are involved with this, you know, you might say this more materialist, naturalistic dimension of later German idealism, Zizek feels, and I don't agree with him here, but Zizek feels that um, Hegel has too much of a gradualist model of emergent levels and layers of, of, of nature, which then eventually gives rise to the realm of human spirit, Geist. Um, and Zizek thinks that Hegel errs on the side of, over, of overemphasizing a sort of smooth continuity that takes us from um, you know, space, time, uh, you know, inorganic mechanical physics, you know, all the way up to, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, sentient animal life, and then from there on to sapient human mindedness and like mindedness. Um, whereas he feels that Schelling um, is, you know, has much more of this model of, all right, well, you have this, um, this sort of shadowy proto reality as ontological ground zero, and then it produces this rupture that all of a sudden gives us this, you know, in a leap like fashion, this, uh, like the, this dramatic explosion, the yeah. sudden you know, genesis of right. constituted reality as we know it. And of course, he in particular, uh, when Zizek has recourse to quantum physics as his favored branch of the natural sciences to engage with in terms of the scientific component of, you know, a somewhat naturalistic uh, materialist ontology, um, it's Schelling who he sees as the best philosophical partner for quantum physics, um, mm -hmm. where we, you know, where he he constantly uses this comparison between the collapse of the wave function in in quantum physics, and for Schelling, this idea of this shadowy ground that then suddenly congeals out of itself mm -hmm. this absolutely distinct uh, domain of existence as constituted reality. Um, and I think Hegel is not so gradualistic or, or you know, overly emphasizing of continuity in the way that Zizek alleges. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that the problem with um, the version of Schelling that Zizek is working with in relation to quantum physics is that ultimately this is a Schelling who is more or less Spinozist. And, you know, and who, if you take that Schelling and really work through the different ways that Schelling talks about substance in relation to subject or ground in relation to existence, et cetera. To cut a long story short, what you end up having to buy into is something which seems much too much to me like panpsychism, right? That basically for Schelling, nature is already in and of itself spiritual or proto-spiritual. It has a kind of intelligence or mindedness and that we finite individuated human beings are just you know kind of outgrowths of this this larger you know macro subject or you know this this kind of cosmic mega mind um, that is for for Schelling what Spinoza is getting at when he talks about God as natura naturans um, mm -hmm. and so I don't consider panpsychism to be a particularly attractive or plausible position and I think by mobilizing a very Spinozistic Schelling in relation to quantum physics in the ways that Zizek does, has Zizek courting the risk of not really in the end being a materialist because I think Schelling, it, yes, Schelling seems, you know, seems like an interesting forefather of things like Engelsian dialectical materialism because Schelling has in his early work, especially a philosophy of nature and interest in nature, but Schelling ends up reworking the very notion of nature such that what we're really getting with him is a kind of repackaged spiritualism Mm. It also involves, you know, panpsychist sensibilities mm -hmm. that I don't think are compatible with the rest of what Zizek himself is committed to. Um, so I'm, you know, I, and I think Hegel is much more careful about avoiding, despite the fact that Hegel is often accused of being a panpsychist among many of the charges leveled against him. Hegel actually successfully avoids, um, you know, having to spiritualize, for instance, inorganic nature mm -hmm. um, so as to...
you know, as Lacan would put it about Schelling, the rabbit he pulls out of the hat is the one that he put there to begin with. He claims to have an account of the emergence of human subjectivity, but it's not really an account of that because he just presupposes the basis of that subjectivity is always already in place mm-hmm. at ground zero and then claims that he's accounting for its emergence. Yeah. Whereas I think Hegel really says, no, I mean, you know, the vast bulk of the physical universe and the ground zero of nature originally is spiritless. It really is just this, mm. this mute, silent, you know, non-sentient, non-sapient, not at all minded or like-minded, <laughs> vast expanse that is done justice to by things like Newtonian mechanical physics, as Mm -hmm. Hegel saw in his time. But somehow, out of this, there does eventually arise in an imminent bottom-up genetic fashion. Mm -hmm. Mindedness and like-mindedness. It'll be be fascinating to see what Slavoj uh, says of being accused of being a (laughs) pan-psychist. (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's a long run and, and, and related to this this got started back in um a 2014 book of mine adventures in transcendental materialism contained really the first line of criticism in this vein where you know i said look you know as far as developing a thoroughly materialistic but non-reductive theory of the subject um one is better off sticking closely to you know, and this to me is almost a matter of common sense to what we are able to make headway on at the level of, of, you know, biology and specifically, Mm -hmm. of course, you know, human bodies and brains um, and questions about whether ultimately all of this could be taught, you know, could be related to quantum mechanics or that we could somehow, you know, establish a link between a very high order phenomenon like human minded subjectivity and this, you know, micro scale, level of of quantum reality i mean that to me right now at least i mean maybe you know decades centuries down the road we might be able to revisit that but in the present state of human knowledge i don't really think that that's we can thoroughly cash that out and are there, even if we, yeah are there, are there i'm sorry are there, are there political and ethical consequences uh that that are tied up into these philosophical um ontological stakes and decisions that, that that are going on here. I mean, I'm thinking of um, some critiques of Zizek's theory of the political act or even of his, you wrote a book called The Cadence of Change, yeah. which was really looking at the way that Zizek and Badju read each other um, in, in very interesting and, and, and there's a very healthy tension there in the, in yeah. the contrast there. But one of the things that they're trying to arrive at is a kind of comprehensive philosophical account for how change occurs um, uh, culturally, socially, politically, et cetera, et cetera. So is there, and I know obviously you've had some uncharitable critiques of Zizek by like Simon Critchley, who will yeah. say, well, you know, the abyssal act is, 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 is really promoting violence, for example. I don't think that you would accuse um, Slavoj Zizek of, of that, but, but what, but are there political, ethical, social uh, consequences here. Could you say something about that? Yes, yes. And I should say, w- with, with Zizek, generally, the disagreements between the two of us have had much more to do with, you might say, you know, metaphysical or ontological issues, you know, much more in the domain of, of classical philosophy, strictly speaking. Um, you know, as far as politics go, I, I feel uh, much less tension. I mean, in fact, you know, I feel, you know, very close to him politically much closer than i feel well that's not exactly correct i mean i feel deeply indebted to and close to him philosophically but there are still some you know some real disagreements that have come to light for the two of us over the course of the past roughly the past decade um but politically you know such disagreements haven't emerged and i can say that um you know for instance to to tie this closely to the answer i gave to your uh previous question um, that, for instance, uh, you know, what both of us are doing in terms of trying to work out a materialist but non-reductive theory of subjectivity um, is to rework our pictures of who and what we are such that, you know, not just at an ethical, moral, political, or at a prescriptive level, but even at a descriptive level, we thoroughly demolish any of the sorts of pictures of human beings, of human nature, et cetera, that are, you know, ideologically and intellectually load-bearing pillars of um, 
among other things, um, capitalism and the ration and the rationalization of it as a socioeconomic system. You know that uh, you know if we look at the whole history of capitalism, you know both as as a socioeconomic system or set of systems, you know, but also its intellectual history, you know, uh, uh, and the development of political economy, you know, as as bound up with, you know, with how it unfolded, you know, over the course of, of you know, the industrial revolutions and onward, um, that, you know, it's very clear that there are certain, you, you might say, that there's a certain philosophical anthropology, which is part of the ideological justification for capitalism as supposedly either the best or the least bad system that we are able to arrive at um, and is what we have to make our peace with, et cetera. Um, and I think that for Zizek, for me, for Badiou, for, for a whole range of, of people, uh, you know, working in, in this overlapping set of, of orientations, um, you know, that we're all invested in, I think that um, part of the stake is, is, you know, destroying what we consider to be false images of human beings that are props uh, providing specious justifications for what we think is ultimately an indefensible system. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think is one of the most important contributions of this work. Yes, it is more abstract intellectual labor, but at the same time, and just taking aim at, because, you know, I, for instance, I teach Marxism to undergraduates regularly. Mm -hmm. And part of what I find valuable about that is getting a sense of, what in terms of um, justifications for capitalism and yeah. like, you know, your average expectable, you know, educated layperson's defense of it, um, you know, what really has seeped down to that level and, you know, has kept people, you know, going along with yeah. this, you know, this, this social status quo. And, you know, it's very apparent to me that, yes, I mean, aspects of the kind of, you know, long standing philosophical anthropology of the sort of creatures that we are that is part mm -hmm. and parcel of non-Marxist and particularly pro-capitalist outlooks indeed is part of popular consciousness. And so, you know, yeah. you know, really yeah. changing the way that is important. I think so too. I mean, it's funny, you know, you, you're, you're uh, responsible for kind of bringing back angles in, in, in yeah. these conversations in contemporary Marxism, but you know, yeah. another part of angles that we should bring back in today's conversation is the angles of anti-during. <laughs> In, yeah. in, in, in purely, I mean, purely as a kind of methodological and stylistic form yeah. of, of educating people, the yes. masses, let's say, about what Marxism is. Why? Because Engels insists that Marxism has a fundamental linkage to philosophy as such. And that's interesting as a because on, on the one hand, it radicalizes the task of the philosopher. And that's very interesting to me because I think the anti-humanist place of Althusser in a way was so critical of philosophy and even, you know, the marks of the thesis on Feuerbach it was trying to kind of destroy bourgeois philosophy and things of that nature. Yeah. So could you say something about like, you know, is, is your project um, sort of, sort of enabling or kind of, or, or helping the philosopher broadly speaking to have a real stake in understanding Marxism for our time? It sounds like that's what's going on here. Can you say a little bit more about that? No, absolutely. And part of why I also wanted to, as it were, sort of resurrect or rehabilitate Engels, you know, because of course, you know, as you well know, um, you know, he often is, uh, uh, I think, caricatured as this quote unquote bad guy who is responsible for, you know, everything that is lamentable or undesirable about the historical development of Marxism. And that, you know, going back to the young Lukács and, you know, for much of the 20th century with, you know, what came to be called, you know, starting with Merleau-Ponty, Western Marxism, you know, and onward even up through today with certain forms of radical leftism. Um, you know, there's this sense that, you know, okay, you have Marx and Engels, and in terms of, you know, everything that is valuable, of enduring, worth, etc., in the Marxist tradition, that can all be traced back to Marx himself. And then all of the deviations, missteps, mistakes, errors, etc., all right, that's all Engels' fault. And, you know, it's, it's of course, from a psychoanalytic perspective, it's like a crude Kleinian splitting operation. <laughs> Good object, bad object, you know, <laughs> Mar uh, you know Marx, Engels. Um, but, uh, you know, anti-during, right? Um, mm -hmm. it's, very, it's, it's very fitting you mentioned that work in particular of Engels's mm -hmm. because, you know, again, as you know, 
um, you know, that was almost itself really the Bible for yeah. large segments of the working class movement for quite some time. Yeah. Um, and um, of course, uh, you know, you you can take issue with various and sundry of, of the details with, all right, you know, is Engels offering here a faithful uh, rendition of this aspect of Marx's critique of political economy, et cetera. And yes, you can you can nitpick about all of that um, quite, a, quite a lot. And, uh, but at the same time, th- that book, in my view, had two very crucial virtues, you know, thanks to which I think it deservedly was given a certain pride of place um, in, in the wider circles of, of, of the labor movement in certain times and places. Um, one, um, and this is something I admire Zizek, among others, for trying to do too, it really does attempt to explain all of this to, you know, not even necessarily an educated lay reader, but just a lay reader. I mean, Engels is striving to make this as Communic- you know, as able to be grasped and 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 appreciated in its essentials by you know a barely literate you know hourly you know wage laborer in an, in a you know industrial factory, um, he's trying to open it up for for you know such members of the movement too. Um, and so that effort of popularization. I mean, people often take you know easy, cheap pot shots at. at you know, popularizations, but it's like, I mean, I haven't mastered the ability to, to write like that. Um, and I think it's important that they are people who constantly are trying to do this in relation to any body of ideas that is worth disseminating. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I think the popularization effort, yes, it might create certain conceptual problems in specific instances, but it's worth running the risk to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think Engels, you know, deserves credit for not having lost sight of that task, despite also at the same time, you know, really, you know, having to do things like deal with all of this manuscript material of Marx's, you know, particularly after Marx's death, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's also the fact that it's one of the rare works of, of Marxist literature where Engels really tries to survey a whole series of domains. I mean, there's, of course, the discussion of political economy in there, but he also has things like, of course, his forays back into the dialectics of nature, uh, you know, as he developed it in you know, a book of that title, plus, you know, Ludwig Feuerbach and the Outcome of Classical German Philosophy. And so an attempt to really have a a Marxism that is not limited to the strictly historical materialist concern with political economy, but it deals with that and then embeds that in a larger context where there are other areas, uh, you know, that Marxist materialism has, you know, important things to to contribute to Mm -hmm. the consideration of, including issues I'm doing naturalism, natural science, etc., Yeah. And well, so, I mean, and- yeah, because a lot of folks today, um, you know, in the value form Marxist um, school of thought will sort of be the ones to give what I would consider the strongest rebuke to philosophical Marxism. And I understand to my the best extent, you know, that I can. I understand where they're coming from, that, you know, we've only had just in the past, you know, 30 years, really access to all of this extra stuff from capital and Marx's economic writing. So we're still in this kind of sort of um, germinal process of fully grasping the profound insights um, into the abolition of value form. So value abolition needs to be central to any Marxological praxis. But I think that the problem is, is that they basically leave no space for um, the conversation of how Marxism informs other aspects of human existence, of social life, and indeed of of philosophy. Um, I want to actually pivot, Adrian, to talk about Hegel now. Um, We've said already there's a Hegel renaissance afoot. Robert Brandom has a uh, a book out on the phenomenology. I want to ask you your thoughts on on Brandom's uh, Spirit of Trust. And I also, before you even start to talk about that, can you tell uh, viewers and listeners what your favorite translation of Hegel's phenomenology is in English? Yeah, well, um, I'll start with the, the last part there. I have to confess, I haven't had time to carefully go through Terry Pinkard's uh, you know, more recent uh, retranslation of it for the Cambridge Hegel series. Um, the next time, which will happen you know, at some point within it's 
roughly every two or so years, I teach a graduate seminar on the phenomenology. And, you know, with the next iteration of it, my plan is to use the Pinker translation in part just so I can force myself to sit down and really, you know, assess its merits vis-a-vis what I've, you know, thus far been relying on the older, very familiar 1977 Oxford University Press uh, Miller translation. Um, so, you know, thus far I've, I've tended to use the Miller translation, but, you know, when I'm, when I'm writing on Hegel, I always, a, a rule with him and with Lacan too, with the two of them especially, is I always force myself to go back and look at the untranslated original text, you mm-hmm. know, and, you know, just say, okay, you know, how does Hegel articulate this in German? How does Lacan express this in French? Um, and, you know, so, you know, to not be overly reliant on no matter how good it is, no matter who's done it, uh, not to be overly reliant on, on any one or, or set of, of translations. But anyhow, so Miller thus far, but not, not based on an informed assessment of, in particular, Miller vis-a-vis Pinkard. Um, so, if, you know, a few years from now, I'll be able to answer that que- that part of the question better after I've I've taught the phenomenology another uh, 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 in a future semester. Um, but then, um, you know, in terms of Robert Brandom's Spirit of Trust, um, I should say I it's that book came out just after uh, Robert Pippin's book on Hegel's logic, Hegel's Realm of Shadows, uh, appeared, um, and because of a debate I was already uh, engaged in with Pippin. I remember it was I, I, it was spring of 2019, if I recall correctly. Um, and I was waiting for Pippin's book on the logic to come out before I wrote a critical response to him. Um, and then, you know, Brandon's book came out at the same time. And I read it at the time I was writing this reply to Pippin. And it became very clear to me, you know, I should also fold an engagement, a critical engagement with Brandon into the response to Pippin. Um, and so, you know, uh, there's a longer answer to this in text form, um, you know, in print, you know, a piece by me entitled The Difference Between Fichte's and Hegel's System of Philosophy, a response to Robert Pippin, that also contains a lot of engagement with Brandom's spirit of trust. Now, the big pro uh, for me, my biggest complaint about Brandom's book is that, right, so we're being offered something that is meant to be a comprehensive interpretation, a, a walkthrough of, of the phenomenology as, as a single work. So focusing just on Hegel's phenomenology. And on page one, literally on the first page of the book, you know, Brandom, you know, it talks about the ground he's going to cover. And at, at one moment in that long opening paragraph, he says, well, I'm going to skip over the chapter entitled Observing Reason. And then when he talks about reaching the conclusion of the phenomenology, he talks about reaching the conclusion of the spirit section prior to its closing set of chapters on quote unquote absolute spirit, where Hegel discusses religion, art, and philosophy. And in and and Brandom, particularly when he says he's going to skip the chapter on observing reason, he offers no explanation for it. You, you are left to instead infer why he's doing this in a book which is otherwise being presented as this is going to be a comprehensive chapter by chapter walkthrough to phenomenology. Well, why are we skipping this one part in the middle and then not actually following it all the way through to its very end? And we know that for Hegel, you know, you really can't understand the beginning of the phenomenology uh, without reaching the very end, namely the chapter entitled Absolute Knowing. Um, and um, particularly with the unex- the the literally the the un- unexplained, not at all defended or justified skipping of observing reason. Well, that's the chapter in which Hegel talks about the combined importance of the birth of natural science early in the 17th century, with especially you know thanks to Francis Bacon and the 1620 New Organon. You know, for Hegel, Baconian modern empirical experimental natural science and then eventually you know in hegel's you know thanks to his contemporary Schelling, Schelling's philosophical digestion of the legacy of 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 modern science in the guise of schellingian natural philosophy it's very clear that the chapter on observing reason is concerned with the significance of that set of developments and of course brandom is is you know, in terms of his own philosophical sensibilities, I mean, as we know, he uh, has debts to a range of, of, of predecessors and traditions. Um, one of them is American pragmatism. 
uh, thanks to you know his his advisor Wardy. Um, you know another is is Wilfred Sellers and Sellers' legacy at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, there's a lot of Kant, etc. And um, you know of course Brandom like Pippin um, wants a Hegel who is in particular shorn of any commitments to anything that could be deemed naturalism. Right, that both of them, one of the common denominators between Brandom and Pippin is that, you know, they think that Hegel is a committed anti-naturalist um, and that he does not believe that there is any way to generate a plausible philosophical account of the emergence of subject from substance, of mind from nature, etc. Um, and, you know, so they they the way that they both read Hegel involves them having to almost, you know, deliberately scotomize to just willfully blind themselves to those mm. places in Hegel's corpus that, that mm. simply defy yeah. that picture of him that they claim is still historically accurate. They literally have to falsify the historical record yeah. to make their version of Hegel plausible. I mean, Hegel yeah. did write a natural philosophy as the entirety of volume two of the encyclopedia. He mm. did write about these issues in the observing reason chapter, the phenomenology that Brandom inexplicably skips over, um, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, to me, it is, they want, um, you know, to claim that Hegel is somehow compatible with sensibilities that are much more Kantian, Solarzian, and even in Brandom's case, pragmatist, then I think the evidence shows Hegel would not have been comfortable at all mm -hmm. with being depicted as they depict him. It's just, yeah. it's literally, False, historically speaking. And so, what 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 is up with um, the 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 centrality of recognition as a kind of guiding uh, rationale of 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 sort of Hegel's social and political thought? And you see this in Pippin a lot. Um, why is that wrong? Why is that limited? Maybe uh, why why is Hegel not reducible to kind of thinking about social sociality, social relations as trying to, you know, merely reinforce kind of recognitive basis of, of social life. Why is that kind of inadequate? Now, um, well, one way to put it is that, um, you know, a lot depends upon what you identify as constituting the core of Hegel's system. And there are some readers of Hegel, I mean, for instance, this is one of the big flaws with, you know, to go back to a kind of intellectual godfather of the entirety of 20th century French philosophy, Alexander Kozhev, right? Um, you know, Kozhev's version of Hegel was entirely centered just on the, pheno the 1807 phenomenology of spirit alone. Um, and, you know, that, you know, Kozhev brings out some very interesting ideas through his particular way of engaging with that Hegel, um, you know, and is rightfully very influential for, you know, several generations of French thinkers after him. Um, you know, uh, but at the same time, I mean, as a work of Hegel scholarship, it leaves a lot to be desired. It's not mm -hmm. even that accurate apropos of the phenomenology. And well, he's also hugely influential to American philosophers yeah. through Strauss too. That's right. That's a, lot right. Of people, a lot of people today, by the way, as an aside, say, well, you know, really, uh, Kojov was a Stalinist. And he was. He was. But I make the argument that it doesn't really make sense to read his philosophy of Hegel as Stalinist. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with that, too. I don't. It's, it just I, doesn't. I, I, no, I don't think that you can call the seminars on the phenomenology he gave in the 1930s Stalinist. Yeah. Um, no. Um, so yeah, we're in agreement about that. Um, and, you know, with, with, um, you know, with, with, uh, you know, with the uh, uh, Pittsburgh school, I mean, when we talk about Sellers, Brandon, McDowell, um, when you look at Sellers as having kind of helped initiate the interest amongst a certain set of analytic philosophers in Hegel, because right, before, you know, really prior to Sellers' 1956 empiricism and the philosophy of mind, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find much by way of favorable Anglo-American analytic engagement with Hegel, right? I mean, instead it was very much, you know, the view that had already been put in place at the dawn of the analytic tradition, which emerges in part through a rejection of, of 19th century British Hegelianism. I mean, part of why I think Hegel has enjoyed this renaissance and become so central to a lot of philosophers right now is that so much has to, you know, so much of the past 200 years of philosophy 
you know, has had to do not only with Hegel's influence, but also with a rejection of it. I mean, to understand the analytic continental split is impossible without understanding, you know, the, the, the different reactions to Hegel's, you know, long legacy. Um, and that analytic philosophy, just as, you know, of course, modern philosophy with Descartes and, and Bacon, among others, is born in part through a rejection of Aristotelian uh, scholasticism. Um, you know, likewise, the rejection of British Hegelianism is just baked into the, the, the DNA of Anglo-American analytic philosophy. Um, and Sellers, you know, in the middle of the 20th century, bravely, you know, kind of pushes back against this. And in Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind, uses the opening chapters of the main body of the phenomenology, the, you know, the moments of the section on consciousness, you know, to raise issues that are recognizably relevant for, you know, analytic epistemologists and philosophers of mind. Um, you know, and then you have, you know, Brandon and McDowell as, as Sellers' as, you know, sort of Pittsburgh heirs. Um, and, um, you know, of course, if you look at uh, Brandon and McDowell's work, like Sellers before them, they tend to focus largely on the phenomenology. There's not much engagement with the rest of Hegel's corpus on their parts. Mm. Pippin is a bit different, right? Pippin has a much wider ranging scholarly engagement with Hegel's corpus. But um, it's clear that for, for Pippin, um, really the, the, the alpha and omega, the unique nucleus of Hegel's system is the logic, um, and, and especially the science of logic. And that's even the case, I mean, Zizek sometimes similarly seems to indicate that in his view, when we're talking about the essential core of the Hegelian system, it's really his logic. And here I got to say, I disagree with all of them because really? I think, yes, because mm. I think that, you know, for Hegel, however important the logic is, it is still only a part of what he considers to be the core of his system. Really, the core of his system is the entire three volume encyclopedia of the philosophical sciences. Um, and of course, the science of logic features there in condensed form is volume one, the encyclopedia logic, a shorter version of it. Um, but of course, volumes two and three are both versions of what Hegel calls, as distinct from logic, real philosophy, you know, philosophy of the real. First as philosophy of nature, then as philosophy of mind slash spirit. Um, and that for me, if you take into account that for Hegel, logic alone by itself is not the totality of what he considers to be, you know, systematic absolute idealism as the full articulation of, of, of his philosophical framework in all its integrity um that you know that means that for instance with recognition if, if okay well when we're talking about recognition we're talking about relations between two or more subjects so you have uh you know you have intersubjectivity you have sociality etc and in the phenomenology right what hegel calls phenomenology presumes that you already have all of that richness of human social reality up and running I mean, one of the lessons that we learn in the phenomenology is that even with sense certainty, the supposed like first person immediate relation to the most rudimentary sensory perceptual givens, that implicitly in the background, all of this complex social mediation is already there. And we only come to realize its, its spectral presence in those opening moments after we've gotten to the, uh, you know, the lengthy closing section on spirit. Um, but phenomenology for Hegel, if you limit yourself to the phenomenology, you can think, well, given that so much of what the phenomenology is about is the social mediation of our mindedness and like-mindedness and of, you know, and, and that we can't get to grips with classical epistemological or ontological questions without taking into account the social and historical influences, etc. That, that definitely holds for the phenomenology. It's certainly true of that branch of Hegel's philosophy. And the logic, I mean, Hegel says this is ultimately about pure thinking or thinking, thinking, thinking. Um, and if you restrict yourself to Hegel uh, in terms of the phenomenology and or the logic, you could believe that, well, he's not, you know, he's going to take an already given form of human subjectivity as always already there. And that's going to be the explanatory basis for all the rest of what you can build up starting from there. But no, Hegel in the real philosophy, which for me is as integral to a system as the logic or the phenomenology. Hegel is interested in getting back behind the sorts of subjects that would be involved in recognitive relations 
and accounting for their genesis out of a pre or non-subjective set of levels and layers of reality that are not you know, a matter of what we agree upon by virtue of say, giving and asking for reasons, establishing consensuses, et cetera. You know, all of this sort of, you know, social and intersubjective recognition talk that is so mm -hmm. central to the deflationary Pittsburgh, Chicago axis of today's Hegel Renaissance. You know, they they refuse to ask and answer questions about the very genesis of mindedness, sociality, et cetera, in a way that to me is anti-Hegelian once you take into account that Hegel's system includes philosophy of nature and philosophy of mind as he understands them in volumes two and three of the encyclopedia, and that he cannot, even in terms of just restricting yourself to the core of this system, it cannot be shrunk down to the parameters of what he calls either phenomenology or logic. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is Hegel's uh, sort of imminent social political uh, thought consist of on the kind of political spectrum that we that we know from kind of, you know, reactionary to, to liberal, um, too radical. Is is there a kind of, um, there's obviously a spectrum and a diversity there, and you see something different in the philosophy of right versus maybe even the phenomenology itself, but how do you understand the kind of legacy of Hegel's, of, of reading Hegel politically? Like, is, is yeah. are we, um, are we able to say that really, you know, it's just kind of a terminal liberal thing, or are we really say, well, no, you know, the more radical proposal that Zizek and you and others put down about the Hegel-Marx connection. And that in fact, and I want you to talk about this as well, uh, uh, we don't start with Marx. We have to actually go back to Hegel. And why is that? And I think that that, can you say something about that as well as Hegel's sort of fundamental political place? Yeah. Well, it's it's funny. I One of the pieces I recently finished writing um, is an essay that, uh, was commissioned for um, the online journal Crisis and Critique that I've that I've been involved with, and their most recent issue available online is uh, an issue devoted to um, Hegel's political philosophy, specifically marking the 200th anniversary of uh, the 1821 philosophy of right. Um, and what I ended up uh, uh, composing for that for that issue, and 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 then this is also ended up being the first chapter in this book on Marxism and psychoanalysis I just finished. Um, it, uh, you know, really you know, directly addresses these sorts of questions apropos Hegel. And, you know, to, you know, to, to condense all of this down to, you know, again, to cut a long story short, um, I think that we have to distinguish between, you know, Hegel's own personal political views that we can infer, uh, you know, I think quite reliably, not only from, um, you know, the, his philosophical texts that we're familiar with as, as uh, you know, constituting his corpus, but also from his course, his private correspondence, you know, from biographical details we know, you know, we can say that, you know, at the level of Hegel's, you know, personal disposition, that he was inclined to be, um, you know, a, a more a kind of a, what back then I think we could, perhaps anachronistically described as more like a center leftist, um, you know, very much in favor of what he saw as the, the progressive gains in terms of liberty, equality, fraternity of the French Revolution. We know that he was enthusiastic about Napoleon exporting a lot of that at bayonet point, you know, into the German speaking world. Um, and that, you know, Hegel deeply valued things such as, you know, the Napoleonic idea of, of, you know, meritocratic, you know, openness of, you know, positions to talent and education, et cetera. Um, you know, and that these kinds of, you know, progressive, you know, liberalizing reforms, you know, Hegel, you know, was very much in favor of. We also know that, you know, despite him, I think, very rigorously thinking through the, I might risk saying, the necessity of the horrors of the French Revolution during, you know, the early 1790s, you know, the height of the terror, um, you know, and the famous discussion of this in the phenomenology, absolute freedom and terror. Um, you know, I think Hegel was, you know, personally, you know, like so many onlookers, shocked and horrified, really repulsed by the violence, but at the same time, you know, was willing and able to, as a philosopher, think through why, in a way, it, this disaster had to unfold in this particularly bloody catastrophic fashion um, and to comprehend its its necessity after the fact um, in you know very good characteristically Hegelian fashion. Um, but there's a difference between you know Hegel's own you know personal private convictions in terms of you might say almost just his 
his taste in politics versus the consequences of what he actually says in his serious political philosophical works. Um, and that whether Hegel would himself have as an individual consciously endorsed all of these consequences, agreed with all of these implications, et cetera. Well, in a way, I mean, you know, here I'm sounding a bit like a Foucauldian or Derridian, you know, we can just, you know, consider the author dead, always already, you know, and, and not bother ourselves with questions of trying to read their minds in terms of authorial intentionality. But, you know, I think if you take all of the different puzzle pieces that Hegel lays out in front of us in terms of his political philosophy, and, and this, he wrote about it, you know, quite a bit. I mean, his, his, you know, his very first publication in the late 1790s was his anonymous translation of these uh, letters condemning the Swiss aristocracy by a dissident lawyer living in exile in Paris, Jean-Jacques Cart, um, and Hegel's commentary on Cart's letters about the Bern aristocracy. It's his very first publication. Very last publication in 1831 before he dies is his text on the pending uh, overhaul of the parliamentary electoral system in, in Britain. You know his his text his essay on the English Reform Bill, um, and you know and in between as well. Like so, there's not just the philosophy of right, but of course this plethora of political interventions by Hegel across the full arc of his his intellectual career. Yeah, and Lukács um, Lukács has the yeah. whole argument that the young Hegel was a deep reader in in uh, political economy uh, as it was available to him, even though uh, right. Yeah. So, yeah, he was. No, and Hegel was very influenced at that point. I mean, we have to bear in mind the the significance, the historical significance of the Scottish Enlightenment for German philosophy. I mean, of course, the the the, the exhibit A here is is Kant himself. I mean, you would not have Kantian critical philosophy without, in particular, Locke and Hume. Um, that you know, Locke's uh, 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 you know basically elevation of epistemology to first philosophy, and his 1690 essay concerning human understanding, and then his insistence on the limits of our knowledge, you know, and then likewise later Hume's powerful mm. challenges, um, you know, to to rationalist epistemology. Um, that the you know we you know Kant you know and Kant is open about this. It's Hume who awoke him from his dogmatic slumber, and that slumber was a Leibnizian, Wolfian, rationalist, uh, you know, philosophy that was just the, the, the standard in the German Academy in the 18th yeah. century. Um, so you know, the, you know, especially with Hume, it's like the Scottish Enlightenment is is in part responsible for even giving birth to German idealism. And then with Hegel, yes, um, Lukács is absolutely correct here, and we have plenty of textual evidence to show that as early as Hegel's time as a house tutor in, in, in Burns in Switzerland, um, right after he had finished seminary in Tübingen, he was he was immersing himself in things like Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, you know, the work of Ferguson, you know, of Mandeville, of you know, all of these seminal figures in the early history of British liberalism and the foundations of the discipline of economics in terms of you know uh, British political economy. That mm -hmm. yes, Hegel and of course some of this Marx was not able to be aware of because some of this we know only thanks to texts of Hegel's from the pre-phenomenology Jena period that didn't get published until the 1930s and that of course were part of what motivated Lukács to write the young Hegel to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, and he's right that it's clear that as early as things like you know the uh, you know the system of ethical life that Hegel circa 1802 1803 was already beginning to distill his reading of, you know, of political economy and especially British, you know, uh, uh, political economic thinkers. With, that was already beginning to filter into his philosophy. Um, and like he mentions, for instance, in the, in the system of ethical life, the Smithian pin factory is the example that opens the wealth of nations and has reflections on, on you know, developments connected with uh, modern in industrialization, et cetera. Yeah, mm -hmm. so there, there is, it's not just Lukács making this up. There really yeah. is, a, Hegel, the political economist, is there from early on. So let's, let's talk about Marx and Hegel, the Marx and Hegel nexus. By now, you know, Zizek's presence in the philosophical community today is very uh, profound and everybody knows it's almost axiomatic for him that the only way to revitalize uh, Marx is by going back yeah. to Hegel. And, and what, what can, can you summarize sort of the, the, the logic that both you and he share alike there? And, and maybe for leftists, this is actually why Hegel has reemerged even for us in recent time as this necessary figure that we must pass through. 
Yeah. Uh, I want to invite you to describe why we actually have to go back to Hegel in order to fully grasp um, the importance of dialectical materialism. And I know, obviously, for you, dialectical materialism actually needs to be, we need to go beyond that too. But but why do we go back to Hegel? What is this about? Yeah, well, I think this, and here I want to start by, you know, treating Marx and Hegel as, as, as you know, sharing things in common, you know, apropos at least the beginning of my answer to your question. Um, and I think that we're finding that, you know, there's the Hegel Renaissance, but there's also, I will say, like when I teach things like, say, Marx's Grundrisse or Volume 1 of Capital, the, de the student demand for that material, I mean, specifically for the mature Marx of the historical materialist critique of political economy, there's as much enthusiasm, passion, you know, hunger, desire for, for, for dealing with that Marx as there is also likewise for Hegel. Um, and we might ask ourselves, okay, well, what is it that is, uh, you know, responsible for this renewed upsurge of enthusiasm amongst, you know, many people, you know, situated in, you know, in different camps? Why are, are, are Hegel and Marx, you know, coming to the fore again so forcefully? Now, part of me wants to be extremely charitable to the two of them, um, you know, really recognizing just how amazing they, they each are to say, you know, even though Hegel famously denied that we have any predictive power, right? His image of the Owl of Minerva being the, the kind of crystallization of that denial that we can see into the future, however gifted we are as, as philosophers, thinkers, etc. Um, you know, and then of course Marx laying claim to a certain qualified approximate predictive power about future social history. But you know, that disagreement between them aside, you know, one could say more charitably that yes, I mean, they both foresaw a great deal of what for them was the road ahead in terms of the future course of, of modern social history um, that has given them a lasting, enduring relevance. But I want to actually say, and this allows me to, to I think, really uh, succinctly answer the question about like Zizek's arguments, for instance, for Hegel being more relevant than Marx today. Um, that with both Hegel and Marx, I think part of the renewed enthusiasm for them, why they both are enjoying certain sorts of renaissances, is not so much due to prophetic power on their part as to we haven't managed to make much progress beyond a lot of what they were looking at, or we have regressed back to things that are closer to what they had in view. I mean, when you think about, um, you know, of course, the, you know, the middle of the 20th century, where you had this anomalous situation in which in the aftermath of capitalism self-induced crises, where it gave rise to two world wars with a Great Depression sandwiched in between. It was temporarily forced in order to stabilize itself to make a lot of concessions, for instance, to labor and to you know, various like leftist political causes, um, so, such that you know, for a period of time, you know, we had a more, in the Western world, you know, we had a somewhat more robust welfare state, you know, a lessening, even though there were still lots of wealth inequality, it was less, you know, appalling or egregious than it had been, you know, say in the Gilded Age or the Belle Epoque. Um, and, you know, this lasted, as we know, you know, from roughly 30s and 40s through the 70s, you know, and then you have Reagan, Thatcher and company, the neoliberal revolution, etc. <laughs> yeah. And thanks to 40 plus years of that, we are now back to levels of wealth inequality that we haven't seen since pre-World War One, um, you know, and uh, or, uh, or pre-French Revolution. <laughs> yeah. That's right. It's a yeah. We're on the. We now are are looking at capitalism being on the cusp of producing its first trillionaires. You right. know, we have a situation in which the top one percent, uh, uh, in terms of the wealth scale, control almost fifty percent of total wealth and resources in the world, et cetera. You know, so um, you know, I think that we are now back in a much more rapacious unregulated, vicious form of capitalism that is much closer to you know the Dickensian England that both Hegel and Marx were looking at through in part the eyes of you know the British political economists, liberals, et cetera, who they were also both reading. Um, and so in a way it's that there's a Hegel and Marx renaissance, especially politically, because we have regressed back to conditions that they were, you know, mm. all too familiar with. Mm. Um, that has made them much seem much more relevant than say, you know, you know, in the Reagan 80s or the Clinton 90s, right? And I think that that's a factor. Now, for Zizek, though, when it, when we talk about today in the conditions of, of, of 21st century geopolitics, why should we prefer 
Hegel to Marx? Like, what is his argument there? And, and really, it, to, to the best of my knowledge, the first place where he explicitly makes this argument is actually in Less Than Nothing. Um, you know, but it's recurred since. And it's one that I think is, that I, I, I largely agree with. And it's that, all right, um, that of course Marx was very invested in the idea of a specific revolutionary agent of a certain sort being responsible for moving us beyond capitalism. Um, of course, this would or be proletarian. You know, nothing. Yes, Marx is proletarian, um, and that you know uh, I think you know, Zizek is of course hardly alone in this. I mean, you could even say that a lot of Marxism and post-Marxism of especially of recent decades has involved the search for, it, you know, if there is going to be a revolutionary agent, it certainly isn't going to be what Marx had in view in terms of this particular, you know, socioeconomic class that, you know, was epitomized by the British working class uh, of, of the 19th century. It's not going to be that. So, you know, the idea that you're going to have an industrial proletariat as the revolutionary vanguard, that just seems implausible to, I think, pretty much all right, of us. Right, right. But and, and then, you know, at least for those of us who aren't ready, willing, and able to give up on the idea of the possibility of revolution, that, that the question then becomes, what actual or potential agents might there be in our altered social circumstances and you know the landscape that we inhabit today which however much it might resemble certain features of like say you know i mentioned earlier the the, the viciousness the rapaciousness of dickensian capitalism all of the you know 19th century industrial england that marx focused on um yes there are some similarities but of course as we know there are also profound differences and so you know i think for zizek it's specifically the hegel who talks about the rabble who would be closer to Marx's lumpen proletariat, right? So not those who are mm -hmm. uh, you know, not exploited labor, but those who don't even have the opportunity to have their yeah. labor exploited. You know, those yeah. who are just abandoned as an excess yeah. surplus population, um, and you know, who at most you know eke out a very kind of marginal, you know, barely surviving existence. Um, and you know, Zizek saying. You know, this broader category that Hegel introduces uh, under the heading of de Peuble, of the rabble, um, is much, much closer to a picture of what a possible revolutionary agent in our circumstances might look like. You know, um, you know, what if it were the case that, say, you know, in a context like, you know, the urban centers of Brazil, that you actually like had mass organization of the population of favelas or, yeah. you know, or, you know, and, you know, even, you know, struggles that I know people in the labor movement are working on today. How do you organize migrant labor that crosses national borders, et cetera? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we're all on the hunt. Those of us who haven't given up on the idea of revolution are on the hunt for what would the replacement for right. the role of the revolutionary role of the industrial uh, proletariat look like. Um, and that, you know, Zizek also, you know, you know, in part influenced by the work of someone like Frank Ruda, et cetera, you know, the, the sense that, well, the Hegel who talks about the role of the rabble is a, a good starting point mm -hmm. for beginning to rethink this side of Marxism. And, you know, I think there is something to that. Yeah. Who, who is your favorite um, Hegel interpreters and people that kind of, Who's at the the vanguard or the forefront in your view that maybe some names that we might not not know about as much that are working on Hegel's today that you find just really exciting or really interesting or that really sort of um, pique your curiosity? Could you could you yes. name people that, that, that folks can kind of can kind of um, look into themselves? Absolutely. And what I'm doing right now is I'm craning my neck back because. Uh, I fortunately have a lot of my Hegel secondary literature right behind me, and so I'm like, oh, okay, let's not rely <laughs> upon my 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 sleep deprived, you know, strained parent brain that's probably at this point suffering from early senility or <laughs> and, uh, pan pandemic enhanced absent mindedness. Um, but uh, yeah, just going through and like looking at this, yeah, there are a number of people. Um, you know, one person who, not just for Hegel, but for all of German idealism, and even just for 18th and 19th century German philosophy in general, who I think is a great historian, who if you want someone who is just 
scrupulously accurate and really tries to do full justice to everything that these authors committed themselves to in print. So by contrast with, you know, the revisionistic tendencies of someone like Brandom, let's just pretend that Hegel, you know, really just wrote the phenomenology, didn't write that chapter on, on observing reason, you know, didn't talk about absolute spirit, and we'll go from there. Um, someone who I think is great um, for his, especially for being historically grounded in Hegel and German idealism is Fred Beiser. Um, and, you know, um, he, a number of his books. Um, I remember in graduate school, I, I, came, I first became aware of his work when I picked up a copy of his 1994 book, The Fate of Reason, which, you know, talks about all of the developments, including, you know, uh, thanks to some now obscure figures who only specialists in German idealism tend to deal with. But the rich set of rapid fire intellectual developments that unfold between, you know, Kant, you know, lay, laying down the foundations of his critical philosophy and the emergence of Fichte's, you know, version of, of Kantian transcendental idealism. And so this journey from Kant to Fichte and, you know, all of the characters and positions and perspectives that were in play there, I, I, I was, uh, I really loved that book. I mean, it was almost like a, a, an exciting, thrilling fiction page turner. Hmm. Um, and then, you know, later, you know, uh, 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 Beiser brought out his book, German Idealism, The Struggle Against Subjectivity, mm -hmm. which really looks at Kant, uh, Fichte, and Schelling. And then he published, after that, a separate book just on Hegel. And I think, you know, starting with these books by Beiser, if you want to really orient yourself in the time and place and get yep. your bearings as for not just the big four of German idealism, but all of the host of other um, you know, figures who were involved in developments in German philosophy and culture in that period. He's, he, I think Beiser, in that, uh, especially for that, can't be beat. Um, so I'd highly recommend him. Um, there's also a younger Hegel scholar at Penn State right now, Brady Bauman, um, you know, who a few years ago brought out a really interesting book on negativity in Hegel, you know, primarily, you know, talking about it in relation to his logic. Um, and I think, you know, he's doing some very promising stuff that, you know, takes into account the contributions from recent Anglo-American Hegel scholarship, including likes of Pippin and Brandom, you know, but, you know, in a way that I think is um, more inclined to embrace Hegel's, you know, uh, you might say broader metaphysical and ontological ambitions beyond just being a theorist of, say, social recognition, et cetera. You know, and Bauman's work is good. Um, you know, I also, let me see here, just, uh, you know, looking through here, da, 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 da. Um, ba, 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 ba. Uh, Paul Franks, um, although he hasn't done as much work explicitly on Hegel, um, he also has done some really good work on, uh, especially on, you know, notions of the transcendental uh, amongst the German idealists. And he's more of a writer for analytic audiences, but he he writes about these fundamental, you know, metaphysical and system building issues in the German idealists with a certain rigor and clarity, you know, reflecting his analytic training that also I think is quite accessible for, you know, for readers with a continental background too. Yeah. He, he, like his, his, his book, All or Nothing. Yeah. Um, is really, I think, an excellent recent piece of scholarship on the German idealists. Um, you know, H.S. Uh, Harris, you know, also like Beiser, um, you know, and Harris, you know, his life's work was really, two two volume projects right so you had um initially in the 70s and 80s he did you know the two volume hegel's development you know which took you from basically hegel's first text that we have copies of from his days as a gymnasium basically a high school student you know up through you know like his uh tubing and seminary period and, and the burn period after that and then volume two really focuses on his years at jena from 1801 to the publication of the phenomenology in 1807. And then later in the late 90s, you know, Harris brought out his two volume Hegel's Ladder, which is just a chapter by chapter hmm. uh, walk through the phenomenology. And it is amazingly thorough. I mean, unlike hmm. Brandon's A Spirit of Trust, I mean, no stone goes unturned. And even if you disagree with him about certain points, yeah, I, you know, to fully appreciate the multi dimensional richness of the phenomenology yeah. as a text and yet have it still be clear, it, Harris's Hegel's Ladder is, it, it's, it's, Unfortunately, it's only ever been available in hardcover and is usually super expensive. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. try your library or online, but yeah. yeah. Um, very, very helpful. Um, yeah. Is there any, any other final uh, recommendation you have on that? 
Yeah, because I'm still looking. I've just gotten to the H's. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me see here. Um, you know what's funny, too? It's still in the H's. A book also on Hegel's phenomenology that is has, I think, that is still fantastic. Um, and it's been a go-to for a lot of people for a while, especially approaching Hegel out of the continental tradition, Jean Hippolyte's Genesis and Structure of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. And it's amazing. That book appeared in 1947 in French. Um, and most Hegel scholarship from just a few decades ago already seems a bit dated, you know, a bit inaccurate, a bit passe. Not but this not this one. Um, like Harris's Hegel's Ladder, it's a, a lucid thorough walk through chapter by chapter blow by blow of the phenomenology is in what yeah phenomenology might very well count as hegel's most difficult notate text um you know, and it's really good on that. Um, there's some other stuff too. I mean, I you know, I you know, Kathleen Malibu's The Future of Hegel. Um, yeah. You know, uh, you know, I also I really liked, although I had some issues with it, Terry Pinkard's book on Hegel's naturalism mm -hmm. from a few years ago. Um, yeah, and there, you know, of course, I'm as you as this is no surprise. I mean, I am deeply influenced by Zizek's readings of Hegel. Um, yeah. And those have been very influential you, for my what own do you work. Think about like a left Heideggerian reading, like of Jean Luc Nancy and his um his book on a uh, small book on Hegel. What do you what do you make of something like that? Oh, you mean uh, the book on Hegel, res the restlessness, the restlessness of the negative. Of the negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? I actually it's really I, 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 yeah. I, I remember when that book came out in English translation. I think it was around about two thousand three, and at the time. I was doing a lot of book reviewing for people in part, just I was at the start of my postdoc. And so, you know, I was still, you know, living in basically student penury. Um, and so just to get free books, you know, I do a lot of reviewing work. And I remember I, I, I was, uh, there was one journal that asked if I'd be interested in reviewing Nancy's book. And I said, yeah, sure. Um, now I was braced for, you know, basically a, a kind of rehashing in certain ways of a kind of classical Derridian you know, critical reading of Hegel, which I was not inclined to be sympathetic to. Um, but I was pleasantly surprised, mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that, um, you know, Nancy's way of bringing out the fact that, you no, know, Hegel is not like the, and, and it's all too frequent, especially in, in French philosophical circles, not the straw man caricature of the, you know, hubristic, arrogant, you know, theorizer of everything under the sun, you know, who j just sought to encase all of reality, you know, in the enclosure of this fixed static, you know, e e uh, exhaustive encyclopedic system after which there'd be nothing to say or do, et cetera. Um, you know, that these ideas of Hegel have, you know, involving misreading what he means by absolute knowing, et cetera, that are just common currency amongst Hegel's detractors, especially in certain continental European philosophical uh, uh, circles and, mm -hmm. and traditions. Yeah. Um, you know, the very clear, despite, you know, Nancy's debts to, to Derrida and the legacy of deconstruction, um, I think of a, a very uh, sympathetic uh, recasting of Hegel to that crowd to say, no, that actually that doesn't mm -hmm. really do him justice. And so I, I kind of, uh, I found it very, you know, very worthwhile, especially since the likely audience for, for you know, a Nancy book you know, are so, uh, includes people who need to hear this and to hear yep. that, you know, this standard kind of, uh, you know, polemical punching bag version of Hegel that, you know, is, is just par for the course, you know, in, in some, especially in like certain groups like, you know, the Derridians, actually is not at all fair to the figure himself. Interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you've, you've been so generous, and I want to end with the final question, which is if Badju's right that every philosopher needs to work through Lacan, how do you begin for those listeners <laughs> and viewers that have not cracked into Lacan? Do you Where do you begin? Do you begin with Lacan, or do you begin with secondary literature on Lacan? And if so, which secondary literature on Lacan? How do you, how do you begin to open up that hornet's nest? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, in fact, I've had to wrestle with this question several times in recent years. In part because hundreds of times asked you, of you, but. <laughs> well, but, well, part of what he did, so um, uh, a little over a decade ago, I agreed to, and then promptly regretted as I started trying to write it, um, I agreed to do the entry in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy for Lacan. Mm 
Wow. And I, I agreed to do it because, you know, the Stanford Encyclopedia is, is sometimes the very first resource that even undergraduate students will turn to when beginning yeah. to try to get to grips with a new figure or field. And so I thought, okay, um, I want to provide the best path of entry for, let's say, even like a student or a lay reader who, you know, has not spent any time wrestling with Lacan, and and I cannot presume a deep familiarity with psychoanalysis or, right. you know, a lot of the philosophical sources. Um, and I really just have to explain from scratch. And, you know, the, the editor said, all right, it has to be 10,000 words, and we really want it to cover all of Lacan. Um, and so I agonized over it. Um, but, you know, I tried with that it, it, to the best of my ability to provide, you know, a, a multiple paths of entry into Lacan's work, depending on which aspects you're interested in. But again, a non-specialist would be able to um, hopefully uh, uh, you know, grasp and, and appreciate. And it also includes like a preliminary bibliography of secondary literature uh, you know, to get people started. Then on the heels of that, I was a real glutton for punishment. I agreed to also do an annotated bibliography of secondary literature on Lacan for this this online uh, resource, the uh, run by Oxford University Press, the uh, Oxford Bibliographies and Philosophy, hmm. um, and you know it is much more thorough and it's also annotated so that I have okay introductory works on Lacan, biographies, um, dictionaries, um, more specialized literature like addressing Lacan's connections hmm. to say medieval scholasticism. Which yeah. Of the German idea, and it went through all of these, you know, subdivisions, and then explained in the annotations. All right, here's why this particular source is good for this particular topic or or, or interest. Um, but um, those both of those things are available online, um, and are my more thorough, you know, answer to this sort of question. But another version of this is, you know, the the, the three volume reading Lacan's Écrit collection yeah. from Rutledge that yeah. uh, you know. Derek Hook, Stein Van Hula, and uh, yeah. Callum Neal put together. That's a good one. Well, I also, yeah, it is. But I regretted agreeing to that um, as soon as I started actually working on it because you know they divvied up you know, all the chapters of the Eclipse to different people, and I ended up getting assigned the Freudian thing, and they were very insistent that really we want a line by line commentary. We ah. want you know you to take each sentence and paragraph of the Eclipse and make it clear, accessible illuminate its references, etc. Idiot that I am, I, I knew it. And I kept writing to them saying, this thing is going to be just ridiculously long. And they said, don't worry, Rutledge has cleared us for you know doing very long essays. Keep going. And I ended up writing an accidental book, you know, because I ended up with 250 pages. Um, and it's a ratio wow. of 10 to 1 because Lacan, that is 25 pages long. Um, and it was this attempt to show that there's method to the madness, that Lacan is not just bluffing, that he isn't simply an obscurantist, um, and that you can, you really can translate this into very clear, comprehensible terms and get to grips with it. Um, but for me, like if I was going to, and here to shift away from what might risk sounding just now like shameless self-promotion, um, you know, there are some really good introductory works on Lacan that I think are helpful. I mean, the 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 one that jumps to my mind right now at, as the very first thing I would suggest starting with is Bruce Fink's 1995 book, The Lacanian Subject Between Language and Jouissance. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's roughly 150 pages, very clearly written, and it manages, it was one of the first things in English to really give a well-rounded picture of Lacan, yeah. right? Whereas prior to Fink, Zizek, and others in the 90s giving us this much more fleshed out picture of Lacan based on a full appre appreciation of the different, you know, periods of his, of his, yes. uh, of his intellectual itinerary. Um, as you know, I mean, if you look at the initial reception of Lacan in the English speaking world in the seventies and eighties, it was, it was constrained by only a small number of Lacan's texts being available, particularly in translation. Yeah. And most of those were associated with the 1950s era uh, return to Freud, you know, where Saussurean linguistics and structuralism were, you know, so much to the fore. Right. And think, this is like really one of the first introductions in English that doesn't limit itself to that side of Lacan, but really gives you a, 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 a very lucid overview of yeah. the full scope of Lacan's work. Um, and so that's a great, one to start with. Um, what I would 
what I would suggest is begin with Lacan's it's it, side by side with it. Begin with Lacan's seminars. Um, I agree with those who say the écrit. I mean, Lacan himself joked that they were written, you know, to be unreadable. Um, and yeah, the écrit. Hold off on on that for uh, until you've spent some time with the Lacan of the seminars, who I do think is a little more accessible. Um, and I would even suggest beginning with seminar one and just kind of working through those mm -hmm. early seminars mm -hmm. side by side with things like you know, like Fink's book or other resources. Yeah. Um, and, and if people read it with others is really important. It's really hard yeah. to read Lacan in isolation. There's a reason why Lacanians have what they call a cartel structure, and they do read yeah. line by line. Um, yeah. That's pretty much necessary, in my view. Uh, it's, it is, but it's community building, so there's some upside to it. You're not just you know yeah. sitting in your, uh, all alone per se, right? You're talking about it, you're engaged with it, and when you have yeah. a reading circle. You're reading it out loud and and pausing, yeah. and so yeah, that's all right. Oh yeah, yeah. In Marxist terms, to read Lacan properly, you really need a general intellect, um, oh, yeah. which includes reading yeah. groups, which includes you know secondary sources. Of, of course, at the opposite extreme, you know, it's, it, we're all aware of this phenomenon now um, that there are some who, instead of even reading Lacan, will just simply content themselves with. You know the, uh, the 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 more easily digestible version offered by you know talented interpreters such as Zizek or Fink. Um, you know, and you, you're seeing this now with you know some who yes they're familiar with Lacanian ideas but secondhand. Um, yeah. And I do think that there are rewards to learning to grapple with Lacan himself um, that you miss out on if you just do that. But at the same time, the other extreme of just trying to read Lacan himself alone without any outside assistance you know whether it be secondary literature or reading groups that is going that is extremely difficult and is likely to result in a lot of misunderstandings or or yeah. or you know exegetical dead ends that you know it'll take you a long time to work your way through on your own yeah yeah, yeah. well adrian i want to thank you for a rich and fun exchange today you know i think that our audience the viewers here at zero books and on my podcast are just really grateful for all that you've given us all these references and insights have been just extremely good and nice and uh been refreshing to chat with somebody who's doing such amazing work uh, when does the third volume in the trilogy on materialism come out <laughs> Well, uh, I'll answer that, and then I want to also thank you for uh, for this opportunity, which I've thoroughly enjoyed. Um, the third volume of the trilogy, uh, right now I'm on a year-long sabbatical, and I was intending to write a lot of it during this leave, but because everything keeps getting interfered with by the pandemic and right. the challenges of, of parenting and you know the past four years of me being department chair, I'm a little behind, so what I at this point, I just finished this Marxism and psychoanalysis book that I turned over to the publisher a couple of weeks ago. I'm presently finalizing a co-authored book with Latinian Lorenzo Chiesa mm -hmm. on psychoanalysis vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, the agnosticism atheism distinction, and mm -hmm. you know, very much focused on Lacan and mm -hmm. you know Lacan's relationship to religious matters. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be finished in the next month or two. And mm -hmm. then after that, I'm going to start work on volume three in earnest. Got it. Now. That'll take me a few years because, you know, volume one was heavily focused on French philosophy. Arguably, volume two could be characterized as, as at least grounded in German philosophy with the Hegelian foundations of, of, of that book. And then volume three is where, to come back to what we started with, a lot of analytic philosophy and adjacent fields like cognitive science. And there's a, just a certain amount of additional research work that I have to slog through to, you know, feel that I'm fully... A, fully up to speed on the different things I'm going to draw from. I mean, I'm going to be dipping into literature on emergentism, downward causation, neurobiology of free will, um, uh, epigenetics and plasticity. Um, and, you know, although I've, I've certainly addressed a lot of these topics in print already, um, you know, these fields have continued to generate, you know, additional publications. Yeah. And so there's like a certain amount of catch up reading I need to do once I've gotten the, you know, with these other two books, you know, one off my table now and the other close close to being cleared off my desk. Yeah. Um, 
you know, that I can really take the time I need, which will be a matter of a good number of years, I think. But still, hopefully in the next five to 10 years, that volume three will finally materialize. But Badiou gave me a little bit of comfort with this because I looked at it, I reminded myself, oh, yeah, like when he did, the, you know, he now what he calls his being an event trilogy, right? You know, the being an event itself appeared in 88. We then right. had to wait until two, 2006 for volume two, Logic yeah. of Worlds. And then it wasn't until 2019 that we got yeah. Imminence of Truths as the third yeah. and final volume. So I figure... I shouldn't be so hard on myself and angst too much about how long it takes me. <laughs> All right. Well, Adrian, yeah. thank you so much. We will, we've got to do it again and just yeah. we'll be, we'll be in touch and um, we wish you, we wish you all the best. Well, thank you so much. And I wish all of you the best. Um, I am delighted to be uh, again, a humble member of this particular general intellect. Um, and thank you again for inviting me on the podcast. Cool. All right. Peace out, everybody.